The Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show is sponsored by Acunet Mortgage, an equal housing lender, NMLS ID 255368, and Acunet Realty Advisors, which is a separate company from but still affiliated with Acunet Mortgage. Putting a roof over your head without the headache. Get answers to all of your home buying questions. This is the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. And our Sunday best to you. Good morning and welcome to the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show. I'm Steve Kettelar along with Acunet Mortgage and Acunet Realty Advisors owner Brian Wickert and licensed millennial loan consultant David Wickert. If you have a question or comment, you can reach us by calling or texting the Acunet Mortgage Talk and Text Line at numbers 414-799-1620. So we could be looking a week from today at a possible government shutdown if Congress doesn't do anything. Does that affect us here in the uh, mortgage world? The uh, answer is decidedly and surprisingly no. Um, you know, nobody's talking about this issue, and we are literally down to the last week. Have you seen anything in the news about this? It hasn't been. The French election is the thing that's allegedly going to spook rates one way or another, not the government shutdown. Steve, have you seen anything in the headlines? No, I'm with uh, David on this. Everything seems to be pointing towards the uh, French and European elections. Yeah. So uh, we are you know, living in a wonderland of goodness right now, and... Uh, Rates are down, surprisingly. I, I did the research this morning. The low point, let's just use the 10-year Treasury as a uh, benchmark for interest rates. That's the interest rate that we all pay when the United States government's borrowing money for a period of 10 years reached a low point of 1.37% last July 5th. Uh, that was, what was right it? Right after Brexit. Brexit. So, so maybe if we have Frexit, you know, maybe we'll, we'll catch, another, <laughs> catch another break. Well... And then uh, they kind of crept up over the summer, about a half percent right before the U.S. election on November 8th. On November 7th, the yield was 1.84%, 1.84%. Then it climbed as high as 2.62%, the interest rate. That was on March 13th. Yeah. March 13th. So that's up, uh, do the math on that, 0. 0.6? Yeah. No, 0. 0.8. 0. 0.8. It was up almost a full point, 0. 0.8. And now all of a sudden we're back down to 2.24%. So as of the close of business Friday, you and I as the United States government can borrow money at the low, low rate of 2.24% for 10 years. From a mortgage lending standpoint, we went from, I think we booked a couple people at three and a quarter over the summer on a 30-year fixed rate. Right. Then kind of three, three, seven, five for a long time. Got up to three and a half on a 30-year fix with no points wow. uh, in that week before the election. And now where are we right now? So at the close of business with 25% equity equity and all the other right stuff, 3.99% on a 30-year fix with just $395 in closing costs. The APR is 4.03. So can still hang on to that three handle, overpay for it for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, how, many, how much in closing costs again? $395. Three hundred. Or if you want to do the 15-year, 3.25% with just $700 in closing costs. The APR is 3.3. So you can... If you want to pay that faster and, and keep your interest cost low, that 15 years attractive, too. Okay. So a couple of different ways to go there. And, uh, you know, we're just... Well, with the rise in home prices, thanks to many buyers out there uh, bidding up purchase prices, you might be gaining equity in your home such that if by refinancing you can get rid of your monthly PMI. That might be a savings in addition to, hey, if your mortgage starts with a four handle. Yeah. Uh, I just did a calculation before we went on the air and pretended, let's say, a year ago, you bought a house with 5% down, and you had the trophy rate of 3.875. By refinancing today, but and I did it on a $190,000 loan amount, okay? Um, you would already have that loan amount down to 186.5 by having made the payments nice. this far. And then let's just pretend your house went up 5% in value. Well, now all of a sudden, guess what? You have a little more than 10% equity. That makes the PMI cost cheaper, such that if we did a refi today, even at a slightly higher rate of 3.99, your monthly payment savings would be, are you ready, 83 bucks a month, which is the magic number, which gets wow. you to 1,000 American dollars per year less in monthly payment. So this is the, you know, kind of ridiculous example of, yes, I can make your payment go down $1,000 a year 
even at a slightly higher rate. Why? The magic of lowering the cost of your monthly PMI. Um, so there's multiple reasons to consider refinancing right now. The window of opportunity is open. There's dropping your PMI. There's, of course, the old standby. I call it the, what do I call it? The deuce. You lower your um, loan term by uh, two years, mm -hmm. and then all you have to do is lower your rate by half a percent, and that can produce some really favorable interest rate savings over the life of the loan. And then, of course, uh, refinancing your home equity line of credit right now right. and folding it into a new fixed year fixed rate loan is another great opportunity all right when we come back let's talk about uh, my new list of seven biggest mistakes that first-time home buyers make when we come back right here on the acunet mortgage and realty show and if you have a question you can call it or text it in on the acunet mortgage talk and text line that number is 414-799-1620 Home buying advice from the guys who know it best. This is the AccuNet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. So, what's it like to book the biggest bands in the world at your festival? Where does Summerfest go next after celebrating the 50th year this year? You can hear from the Summerfest CEO, Don Smiley, and VP of Entertainment, Bob Bashit, Babish as they sit down with our own John McCure for a very special WTMJ community conversation. That'll happen at 5 o'clock tomorrow during Wisconsin's afternoon news. You're listening to the AccuNet Mortgage and Realty Show here on 620 WTMJ. Brian Wickert with us, David Wickert with us. We're now up to the seven most common first-time buyer mistakes. Yep, and I'm going to do these in uh, reverse order here. Uh, so number seven, this is kind of like the uh, old David Letterman countdown. I don't think they do that anymore with the new Stephen Colbert, do they? No, uh-uh. No. no. Okay. He, he, All right. Well, he, anyway, I, number seven. Uh, First-time first -time homebuyers sometimes don't even consider renting as a better financial option, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, and I want to go on record and say, Owning a home is not all a financial decision. It's at best part financial and kind of more emotional. But let's say you're making a really small down payment, like a 3 or 5% down payment, and you're not planning to stay in the property at least five years, I'm going to say you should probably not buy because your economic friction of selling, you know, you're probably going to have to pay about a 6% real estate commission to sell. And so you kind of are, you know, at break even. you really got to count on that property appreciating between now and the time you sell. Certainly if you're going to like, yeah, I'm out of here in two or three years, just rent. Um, number two, they don't know any better, and they think that they'll get a better deal if they contact the listing agent directly. And I'm going to call this the cart before the horse, uh, meaning that they sometimes people will go out and they start shopping for homes. You know, honey, let's just go out and go to a couple of open houses. Well, that's like shopping for puppies. You know, if you go to the, you know, pet store and you see, we're going to look at puppies. You go out and look at some open houses. Guess what? You're going to fall in love with one. And then it's going to be too late to bring in a buyer's agent because once you go to an open house and you see a property with the listing agent, they've got rights to you as the buyer. And they're not going to let another agent come in and represent you. All right. So that's thing number two. Thing number three, you're not comp uh, prepared to compete against cash buyers or buyers with, you know, more of a down payment than you might have as a first-time buyer. And, of course, we have the readily available antidote to that. That's, of course, the rock-solid guaranteed pre-approval, where our whole uh, objective is to put you in the same spot as if you had a larger down payment. Um, number three, or no, no, I'm up to number four. I said they put the cart before the horse. Notice the letter T. Now I'm just going to take away one letter. They put the car before the home, meaning they've got too much of a car payment out there. You know, a lot of times people graduate from school. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is go get that fancy car for five, six hundred dollar payment. Well, if you're married, maybe your wife has done the same thing. You know, pretty soon you have seven or eight hundred dollars worth of monthly debts. And that puts a big dent in your ability to uh, – your purchasing power. Because, of course, anytime somebody asks us, Steve, how much else can I afford? What we're really answering is, what's my maximum monthly house payment? 
which includes yeah. principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And and to, to arrive at that maximum house payment number, it's really a pretty easy calculation. We got to start with your gross income, and then subtract all the other payments that you're making on other stuff. And the biggest offenders there are car payments and student loans. So let's take a little break here. We'll finish up with our top seven. Uh, mistakes that uh, buyers are making in today's market when we come back. Right here on the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show. Find a place to call home without the headache. This is the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. Close out their four-game series this afternoon at Miller Park. Bob and Jeff will have the call. And begin our game day coverage at 12.35 right here on WTMJ. It's sponsored by your Milwaukee Honda dealers. You're listening to the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show right now here on 620 WTMJ. Brian and David Wickert sharing the most common first-time buyer mistakes. Yeah, and we were up to the part talking about how other monthly payments interfere with a a uh, homeowner's uh, first time home buyer's particular buying power and we've literally had situations where you know we get going on the rock solid pre approval process and we say uh you know I actually can think of one where the guy had a six hundred dollar a month truck payment Oof. and we said you know that's limiting your purchasing power to X. If you were to trade that in and get a car that only had a three hundred dollar or no know, payment. Or no payment, right? Pay cash by an old beater. Yeah. You know then you can have this much more home purchasing power. The other big killer, of course, and we've talked about this before on the show, is student loans. Because most uh, students, I'm sure you recognize this, David, are making the income-based payments. The IBR, yes. IBR, income-based repayment, where, you know, let's say uh, your income is $4,000 a month. You only have to pay 10% of your income or 400 bucks. Uh, on the monthly payment, but if you've got 80 grand of student loan debt, how much, David, do we have to use? We have to use 1% of that total balance, so a synthetic payment of $800 a month in your example, because at some point, you're going to have to start paying back on those student loans. Correct, and we've got a loan going right now. Now, you know, a lot of times people who work for nonprofits, you know, they're aware that if they make their student loan payments, I believe it's for 10 years, and you work for a nonprofit, then the federal government is going to allegedly forgive that debt, and their payment's going to go away. So they're just hanging out. It's like, well, why do you have to count that? It's going to go away. It's like, well, we can't count on it. Because In case you switch lose jobs. your job. Yeah, yeah lose your job or you stop working at that not-for-profit. So student loans can be a hang-up. And, you know, if a person goes online and does all the self-diagnosis, they're going to use the student loan payment that they're making. Yeah. They're not going to use the one that we have to use. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, my uh, down to, let's see, three, but th- this is the third from the bottom now, using the David Letterman reverse. They fall in love with what I'm calling unique properties or the idea of buying a foreclosure. We'll Everyone wants a that. deal. Yeah. Everyone, oh, I want to buy a foreclosure. So a couple of examples. I had one first-time buyer write an offer on a 750-square-foot house, one bedroom, one bath, one room sounds like but well no they, you know bedroom bath in that other room okay and uh, and it was perfect because it was a single guy he's like this is perfect for me and it had a, a garage that was more than double the size a heated garage I believe that was more than double the size of the actual house oh right so great workshop you know garage kind of a place awesome but it's like and luckily the offer didn't come together because we would have never been able to do the deal. There weren't other 750 square foot homes. There nearby. are no other yeah. 750 square foot one bedroom one bed. And then you got to realize this: if you buy that unique house, and by the way, the most unique house that Acunet has ever financed is up for sale. It's the one that is literally in the shape of a boat yeah. inside and out, um, on one of the local lakes here. Yeah. It's like limit. The term for it is limited marketability, right? You just don't have very many people who want to live in a 750 square foot house or the house that is it looks exactly like a the nautical house, a boat, right? Um, the other one that I had that came across our desk this week was a guy wrote an offer on a house. Luckily, our loan consultant did not luckily as usual. Our loan consultant did a thorough job and reviewed the offer and noted in the private remarks section of the listing sheet of the 10 acres, five was being leased 
to Farmer Vic oh. to till the ground there. That is what you call deaddeal.com relative to Fannie Mae type financing because it's agricultural and Fannie Mae don't, doesn't do uh, agricultural lending. You've got to go to Badgerland Financial, which advertises on like the Wisconsin Badger games and stuff. They finance rural life. I believe that is their slogan. But their rates are higher. You're not going to get that trophy 30-year fixed rate that we're talking about when five acres of your property is being farmed. Um, on the foreclosure standpoint, I just can't. I'm involved in a rehab right now on, on a relative's house up in Stevens Point. And buying a house, this wasn't a foreclosure, but it was in tough shape because it was a rental. And I just got to tell you, you better have a lot of money. Because and, and patience and handiness. Well, right. If you're not a contractor and knows what to do uh, to make a house right, um, it just costs a lot of money to get those. For, and then you don't know what you're getting because you don't get a, a real estate condition report. You are flying totally blind. All right, boy, my seven top tips is taking a little longer, but I think it's really worth it. When we come back after the news, we'll finish up with, and wait for it, these are the best ones, of course. Number two and number one mistakes that first-time home buyers make after the news when we come back. Right here on the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show on 620 WTMJ. It's now 1030 on this Sunday morning as we welcome in from the WTMJ 24-hour newsroom, Colleen Bolin. Thank you, Steve. Police in Milwaukee say a drive-by. Getting you through the home buying process. Welcome back to the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. Well, we are up to number two and number one most common first-time buyer mistakes with Brian and David Wickert. I just want to say, I don't know if these are mistakes. It's just you don't know what you don't know, not to sound like my mother. But it's just you don't know that your car payment's going to interfere with your... Or your student loan payment and the fact that you're making... Or a unique prop. I'm just, I'm defending my fellow, because this is code for millennials is what you're really saying. So I'm defending <laughs> sure. my brethren... A little bit. I'm calling it mistakes. All right. You think about the right uh, word. Okay. Three. Seven unknown. Uh, knowledge deficits. Thank you. Does that sound more? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, That's good. Right. I like that. Learning opportunities. David, you have a training opportunity. That's what I when, when David doesn't do something right at the office. Saying, David, this is a unique training opportunity for you. Rare as that is. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Number two. They don't buy enough house or they're too timid. On the monthly payment, because really that's what most people, wouldn't you say, David, you do more loan consulting these days than I do. do. Are people, do they have a monthly payment in mind? Yeah, I mean, they want to be somewhere in the range of what their rent is right now, because obviously they're comfortable doing that. And Right, so I say step it up a little bit, uh, and especially when you have people that are being conservative in the amount of their monthly income that they're going to be devoting to their house payment. Mm -hmm. Because remember, a big chunk of that is going right to the principal. It is a forced savings plan, a couple hundred, two, three hundred bucks. You know, I'm just saying, it's okay. not like you're yeah. spending it on rent. But, um, you know, what we do a good job of pointing out is, well, at the number you said at $1,200, mm -hmm. you know, you can buy a X thousand dollar house. You know, let's say the answer is $160,000 home. Mm -hmm. Are you, find, are you seeing any homes you really like? No, they're all kind of crummy and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? If we boosted that up to 1350 you know, you could go to this higher price, which means a whole different either neighborhood or maybe an extra bedroom, maybe mm -hmm. an extra bath, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And my mantra for young buyers, and I hope you are telling all your millennial clients. Of course. Rates are probably never going to be lower than they are now. Buy as much house as you can now, right now. Because if you're thinking, well, we'll just sell it and buy another one in seven years, we don't know what the world's going to look like seven years from now, either from an interest rate perspective or are we going to have 30-year fixed rate loans guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie like we do right now? Remember, that is well, a looming issue. And it could, it's the double whammy of if rates aren't as low and home prices have gone up. It's, hey, that bigger house you thought about buying now is more expensive right. down the road. Right. You can lock in that awesome mortgage right now at what did you say, David? 3.99? Okay, but now here's number one. They wait too long because they think they got to save more for a down payment. Ah, you know, people just walk around with ideas in their head like, i got to have 20% down. Or, no, I heard, you know, somewhere that you got to have 10% down. Told me, yeah. Oh, you know, I heard that the least, but I don't want to pay PMI. 
Right. So, David, what do we have for, you know, the lowest down payment loan that we can offer is, can is 0%. That's and pretty low. That's pretty low. Uh, and, and it does come with income limits. And what are if those? You're, if, 70, if you're just two people living in a home, no more than $73,000 in income. So I think you said it was 73300 Let's not leave okay, off the that, that last 300 in there. Uh, but and that's household income, by the way. Correct. Regardless of who signs on the mortgage. Correct. But what if you have a child or another person living with you in then your household? Then you can spring. They, they uh, allow you for 84295 So in case you can raise a kid for another $11,000 in affordability. But uh, if you fit the WIDA uh, model with 0% down, it's the option could be 4.42% APR. APR with no monthly PMI. Wait, did you say no monthly PMI? So no. if that's what's holding you back, Mr. First-Time Homebuyer, or parent or grandparent, like, yeah, I don't want my kid buying a house and having to pay that evil PMI. Oh, what did you say? We have a program at 4.42 APR with no monthly PMI. What Correct. would the monthly payment on that be? Ballparking the payment depending on the property taxes, but right around fourteen fourteen. Fourteen hundred and fourteen dollars per month. That's for principal, interest, property taxes. You used how much? About four thousand dollars a year in a property year. taxes. And homeowners insurance right. because there is no PMI in this particular example. And it's really a loan where we give ninety seven percent of the purchase price on the first mortgage. Yep. And then three percent of the purchase price is on a ten year fixed rate that has the same APR and same interest rate as the first mortgage. Yes. So that's how you can do it with 0% down, of course. What if we don't want to have income limits? Sure. So, I mean, at a, at a minimum, uh, anybody who's a first-time home buyer can purchase with 3% down up to the Fannie Freddie limit of $424,100. Oh, okay. So, so that's you could a buy a pretty house. nice house. Yeah, yeah. But just as an example, if you wanted to buy a $200,000 house, uh, Acunet could offer 3.875%. The APR is 418 and that's just with 3% down, and, and that's coming to the closing table with uh, $8,500. Which can come from a gift. gift. And then remember, the seller can help uh, with your other closing costs, too. You know what? I could have included that is first-time homebuyers don't realize that there's more to buying a house than the down payment. That, I'm going to make that a uh, corollary. 7.5? Yeah, 7.5. All right. When we come back from this next break, I want to talk about when the home inspection goes badly. You know, how do you... Who gets to throw the red flag onto the field and say, I want to cancel this? And can you get your earnest money back really easily? Because I think that 99 out of 100 homebuyers think, well, yeah, I can just get my earnest money back. Of course, not the case. We'll cover the details when we come back. Right here on the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show on 620 WTMJ. Expert advice on buying a home. Here's more of the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. Some legendary Milwaukee restaurants have closed their doors recently. I think a Carl Rausch is there on that list. But there's been one that's been around for 40 years and still growing. Steve Sazima of Sazes tells Gene Miller about one of the keys to his longevity during this week's edition of WTMJ Conversations. That and more is coming up at 11.07 this morning. So here you are in a situation in the midst of the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show here this morning on WTMJ where you find a great house, you put your earnest money of $1,000 down, and then you go and you get the home inspection, and oh boy, it's just a mess. I'm going to get my 1000 bucks back like that, right? Uh-uh. Nope. I'm afraid not. So let's talk about, because I'm involved in one of these right now personally uh, as a seller-ish. Uh, person and so it's like great first of all they decided because we just rehabbed the whole property and you know in pretty good shape but and they weren't even going to do an inspection then they get the inspection done the day before the inspection deadline runs out which by the way if anyone offers to not do an inspection is like that is there anything better than that at least in terms of things that can trip up a purchase yeah, transaction yeah, right because then excited. Well, which anyway, is dangerous as a so fire. you know and it's an old house so they go through and they their inspector says you know I think there's problems with the basement and the roof and uh, and then you know we get into this whole thing of does the seller have the right to cure so we do under this contract have the right to cure any defects but what you get into is it's still a negotiation right because if the seller tells you hey I found all these defects 
then we as the seller, as the, did I say the seller? It's as the buyer. buyer if the buyer says, hey, here are all these defects that we want you to cure, they can go on and on and on and on and on. Even though defects is defined in the contract, the problem is the word significantly is contained. Significantly affects the value. Significantly affects the health or safety or expected life of the property. Well, what is significantly, you know, made up of? So, uh, you know, how is it defined? It's kind of amorphous. And, and so what you get into is, well, do we force them to give us the super long list of cures or do we try to negotiate it? So we smartly, even though my first nature was, well, give us the list of things you want us to cure because then the ball's in our court. Correct. But they could load you up with. They could load us up with a really long list, which yeah. is the smart tactic on the part of the buyer. Right. Here's 25 things. Good exactly. luck. Right. And, uh, and so we're trying to negotiate our way through it. But now we're also up against the clock. Right. And, and so ultimately everything comes to the lesson for this segment is everything comes down to a negotiation, because on the one hand, you know, like I'm told we can repair the roof. It's a metal roof. So you're supposed to be able to seal it. Uh-huh. And they're like, no, it's got to be a new roof. Well, OK, there's one thing we still got to figure out. But um, it's all it's all a negotiation. And especially when it comes down to the earnest money. So I want to point out that Section 8, page 8 of the uh, Wisconsin Offer to Purchase, talks about how to get the money back. And the key uh, to getting the earnest money returned is that both parties must agree in writing to a written disbursement order. And the Wisconsin Association of Realtors has a form for that. It's called the Consent CMA, Consent and Mutual Camera, Consent and Mutual Release Agreement. CMAR. And so that's, um, or CMRA. It, it's the form that both the seller and the buyer have to sign that says, okay, broker who's holding the earnest money, right. you we can give it back now. It back. Yeah. Well, all it takes is one person not to agree to that. And now you're headed to where? Small claims court. To get your $1,000 back? Up to, I believe the small claims court limit is 5000 bucks. And so beyond so that. So if you put more than $5,000 earnest money, you get to go to big claims court? You get to go to county, you know, district court, like the same place where they try people for murder. Okay. Yeah. So that might that might take a little while. Oh. So the bottom line, Steve, is that it all comes down to negotiation. Even in a case where here we as the sellers have the right to cure, mm-hmm. you know, do we really? You know, because there, there are strategies that can be. You do, but you still got to dance. Painful, right? And so the best course of action, which we're still trying for, is, hey, let's work this out. We need some more time is what we need because we're up against, we don't even have the appraisal back yet. You know, so there's another issue that's complicating matters. All right, David, what are we going to talk about when we come back for the final segment of the show? I have two stories from the front lines of, of home buying when we come back from this last break. Right here on the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show on 620 WTMJ. Don't just find a house, find your home. Here's more of the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show with Brian Wickert on 620 WTMJ. Brian and David Wickert are with us. Guys, I've got a scenario for you. Let's say I'm the seller and the person that I bought my house from had done some renovations that maybe they didn't pull permits on, but... I bought the house, and now I'm getting ready to sell it a couple of years later. And it's discovered that there was renovation work. Well, where's the permits for this in the history of How does that complicate things, or how do you navigate something like that? Oh, it's complicated. It can complicate it a lot. In the state of Wisconsin, you have to fill out a real estate condition report as the seller if you hopefully truthfully by the way oh yeah and there's a line in there i don't remember which line it is but it says are you aware of any work that was done without permits mm-hmm. so if you as the seller knew about that you're supposed to disclose that and then once you do a savvy buyer is likely going to say well it's a condition of my offer i want you to obtain those permits right which building inspectors are happy to do correct the problem comes if there was work done like electrical that is now not no longer visible. So I can tell you that like in the village of Menominee Falls, they just make, I believe it's the buyer, acknowledge, you know, that they will give a post-work completed 
um, uh, you know, certificate, but they'll charge double, which isn't a big deal. So, hey, instead of you're supposed to get it for $100, now it's going to cost you 200 because you got it after the fact. Yeah. But then since the inspector can't see through walls to see if the electrical is done correctly. And they're not going to rip open the wall either. That is the, the kind of intrusive, right? Okay. They, with, they, they get the buyer, at least I know in the village of Menominee Falls, to sign a piece of paper that says, I know that the inspector wasn't able to inspect this, and I'm accepting this property, you know, as is, basically. So the answer, that's a really good question. You should always get permits done. You should always get permits when you have work done because it's going to bite you. uh, Sometime. Sometime when you go to sell the house because then you're faced with a moral dilemma. Do I lie? No. Well, some people might, but that's a problem because then if this comes up when the next uh, owner goes to sell, they can come back to you, you know, years later. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because you didn't tell the truth when, when you sold the house. So. That's a, re- that's a really good one. The other thing I wanted to say about our particular situation is, you know, we've got these various inspection issues. But, you know, if I play hardball on that, we still have the appraisal contingency. And all that has to happen there is the home has to, if it appraises for $1 less than the accepted offer price, that gives the seller the right to throw the flag and blow up the deal. So Or renegotiate. Or renegotiate. But, you know, what I want to do, and I think it's always a better negotiating tactic, is let's try to work this out and, and yeah. be reasonable. So that's that's my favorite approach rather than, you know, trying to back somebody into a corner and say, well, hey, you didn't give this notice in time. So, you know. So you're enjoying the, uh, uh, the contingencies, the uh, – Bases along the way that oh, protects I mean, that protects join? buyers. No. Well, you're 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 living through because I mean, it, which is a good thing, right? That's why when you're buying a house, you want these pit stops, these bus stops along the way. That's right. To make sure that the roof is good, and then to make sure if you're worried about the value that the appraisal comes in at a price that makes you comfortable. Another way to say this is there are really at least three negotiations. Uh, and this is something that first-time buyers, sellers, second-time buyers should all remember and never forget. There's the upfront. Right. Hey, what's the price? You know, when are we going to close? And am I going to pay any of the buyer's closing costs? All that great stuff. That's negotiation number one. Mm-hmm. Then there's a negotiation that happens after the inspection. Yes. What really? I mean, right now we're having dialogue over what really is a defect. Yes. And even though we have the right to cure and prescribe the manner of a cure. You know, they're saying things like, well, no, we need a whole new roof. And we're saying, well, no, we think it can be repaired. So you have to negotiate through all that stuff. And then the final one is the appraisal. So those are the three most common. And you can add to that if you have septic system and uh, well water. Those could be your other related uh, negotiations. Uh-huh. Okay. So that's that's the wrap-up on that. Very gnarly so you're saying it's not, just, up. it's not just uh, pick a price and show up at closing? No, and, th- and that's where good real estate agents really earn their keep, is helping the parties be reasonable, try to keep the big picture in mind, and you know, and get to the closing table so that both parties feel good. So that's what that's what I'm trying to do in this particular case. We'll let you know how that turns out, Probably maybe as soon as next week. All right, what's your quick uh, story from the front line? I was just going to comment. It's the theme that we are uh, talking about on the phone with our borrowers is trying to help them win. And so buyers, buyers, not, not refinancers, people who are looking to buy a home. Yes. Okay. So is uh, I think the secret uh, one secret sauce is the seller credit, which is allows in a in a competitive market where you're offering above either the asking list, price. Okay. Yeah, the asking price to maybe take the sting out of that um, higher price might I- including a seller credit might be that thing that pushes your offer above the psyche of you know, also like if, if the guy is asking 195 maybe you offer him offer him 202 with 202 with a two thousand dollar credit hey that way you're getting some help on the purchase price and uh you're still offering that guy that sexy two handle yeah all right that's it's a it's a good time to be a home seller right now and we would like to help anybody out there i would love to do a bunch of pre-approvals this week so please click on the blue button give us a call We are all about giving people rock-solid pre-approvals this week. That's all the time we've got. We'll be back here the same time next week, Steve. We'll see you then.
This has been the Acunet Mortgage and Realty Show on 620 WTMJ. We're coming up at 11 o'clock. Colleen Bolin will join us next from the WTMJ 24-hour newsroom. The preceding was a paid program. Advice and opinions expressed during the Accident Mortgage and Realty Show are solely that of the hosts or guests of Accident Mortgage and Accident Realty Advisors and not WTMJ Radio or Scripps Media Incorporated.